How's it going? Well, welcome. Hey, welcome to Redemption Park. I'm Mark. If you're new, uh, we're glad you're here. Let's get to work. Matthew chapter 18 is where we're going to be at today as we continue in our uh, series, The King in the Kingdom. Uh, as you're rolling there, uh, just know that this is now coming towards the end of Jesus' life. He's been with his disciples for three years, and, and they still have a problem that I, I still have a problem. I actually have two problems, and this is in spite of the fact that 25 years ago, uh, I gave my life to Christ, and, and the Bible tells me that in that moment, I became a new creation. I was transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the Son God loves. I, I was sealed by the Spirit. Uh, all those things are true of me. In fact, we just kind of talked about it in our catechism. Uh, that is positionally true of me. Like, I am righteous in God's sight, but practically, I've got two problems. And, and the first problem is I still sin. And the second problem is that people still sin against me. So, so I sin, and I sin against my family, I, uh, against my wife, against my children, against my friends, against my neighbors, against the church. If, if you spend enough time uh, around me, I'm going to offend you. Uh, I'm going to wound you. And, and that's just true of, of me, and that's actually true of all of us. And, and all of us in, in this room have also not only done that, we, we've had that done to us. And what the Bible shows us is that when we do that, when we sin, there's always shrapnel to that. No one sins in a vacuum. They're always, and it's always the closest to the person that gets wounded the most, right? So that's, that, that's at the root of my ongoing problem. Your ongoing problem is that, that we sin when we wound those around us and others sin and wound us. And so we get scars and, and we get uh, wounds from that. And, and some of you are, are bringing in those wounds and scars and, and that baggage, actually all of us to some degree from our past. Uh, sometimes it's from just the littlest of age, maybe even before you had memories. There, there is something there that you've tried to work through your whole life. There, we, we just wound one another. Now, when that happens, when that happens, we have two options. There's two ways to respond. There, there is the, the, the way of, of the world. And it, this makes sense because when you... Um, when you're around someone that is sinning, your natural inclination is, I need to get away from that. So in my graphic, you, you want to get away. And, and so uh, that's true of, uh, of individuals, but that's also true of maybe your experience in church. And by the way, uh, if, you, if you decide to lean in and, and get involved in the community of God's people, you will be wounded. And so uh, what we do, if we just kind of take the way of the world is, well, I'm either going to keep my church and my faith family at a distance so that I, I've, I don't get wounded anymore. That, that kind of makes sense. Or you just say, when I am wounded, I'm going to go to the next church. And I'm going to go to the next one and the next one. This is just how, how we respond. In fact, in... Um, in C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, which is kind of a, an allegory of heaven and hell, he has this, this really interesting picture about heaven and hell. And the citizens of hell, uh, what, what, they, what they do is that through eternity, they continue to separate themselves from each other. That they continue to get uh, offended by each other. And so they just go further and further away into this eternal isolation in, in that book. And I thought that was a good picture. That is the way of the world. So when we respond like this, we actually respond more like citizens of hell and not citizens of the kingdom. That there is the way of the king in the kingdom, and uh, that's the second way. It is to lean in. It is to, to not, not be pushed away from uh, when, when sin, because that, that's painful, but it's to lean into that and, and to uh, um, kind of push in and seek the res re restoration, reconciliation, to seek the healing, seek the, the wholeness of that. But that's difficult. I mean, that's actually impossible uh, apart from a work of God's grace in our lives. But this is actually a picture of what we, we want to be a, about at Redemption Parker. We, we say sometimes around here, we want to have a gospel culture. A gospel culture is, is a culture that is centered on uh, the, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and living that all out in, in our lives toward one another. And so part of that is we want to have like what we call a gospel flinch. So, so when one of your brothers or sisters comes to you or, or, or they wound you, they offend you, you, won't, you don't go away from them. The gospel flinch is actually, I'm going to lean in in this moment and, and I'm going to uh, bridge the gap that your uh, brokenness, your sin is creating in this relationship. And this is really, really difficult, but it is the way of the king and the kingdom. 
It's the way of Jesus. When we sinned, he didn't banish us. He came to us and, and he leaned in. Uh, but, but here's the thing about gospel culture. That sounds awesome uh, on a mission statement. It sounds awesome in a sermon. But to actually live like this. And this is the challenge. To actually have a gospel culture. Jesus wants his followers, his disciples, to live out in such a way that they have a gospel culture. He'll say that when when you do that, when you love one another, the world will know about me, and they will know about my love for the world. So how do we do that? Well, Matthew 18 is the the, the preeminent chapter on gospel culture in in all the Bible. And and in in chapter 18, we're not going to cover all of it. You could do several sermons, but we, we... we, calend- we put this on the calendar, and uh, we're trying to be done with Matthew by Christmas. And so that'll be the whole year. Uh, so uh, I'll just summarize the first part before we get into the part uh, of the two obstacles that Jesus says we've got to overcome. We- we've got to overcome in our lives if we are going to have a gospel culture in our home, if we're going to have a gospel culture uh, with this faith family, if we're going to live out this kind of gospel culture. And so, again, Jesus has, has been with his disciples for three, almost three and a half years at this point. He's got about a a week left to live, and he's just downloading as much as he can into their hearts and their minds and their lives. And he's telling them relationships matter because relationships are made of image bearers. And, and because they matter, we, we lean in when there's brokenness. We don't withdraw. And so he, he just kind of gives the church this, this pattern of just kind of some supernatural way of how we reconcile. And this is true. This is good in your, your marriage. This is good in your family. This is good in the church. But he says, the first thing is basically when we're sinned against, we kind of just bear that offense. We, we don't have to hold everyone to account for everything. We, we can uh, do what we told our little girls to do when, when, when uh, they would fight over a doll. Uh, and my, my wife would say all the time. It was a refrain in our house. Cover it in love. But she did this. Well, just cover it in love. But no, mom, you don't understand. I've been wounded. She owes me a debt. Cover it in love. He says, then uh, you, you can also just go to the person. Don't, don't gossip about the person. Don't try to get people on your side, but go to that person and try to reconcile one-on-one. 95% of the time, that's going to be solved there. It says, if you see a, a brother or sister just in, steeped in sin, because you love them, you lean in. And if they still don't uh, respond, then you, you take some others that love them. And it's always for their reconciliation and, and for restoration. And it says, if that doesn't work, bring it to the whole church. Because it matters to God. Relationships matter to God. Now, at this point, Peter and the disciples are listening to this. And imagine this. Three years, you're walking around with 12 dudes that... You're from different backgrounds. Uh, you have Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector. They would have hated each other. You have all these different personalities. Just 12 guys that like each other. Just a massive opportunity for offense every day, right? And so at this point, uh, three years into this, Peter's like, man, I, I think I'm trying to, I'm starting to track with you, Jesus. You're, you're not like anyone else, but, but maybe he's, he's been wounded, and maybe it's, maybe it's Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, and, and though he doesn't do that anymore, he extorted Peter's family in the past, and maybe he's nursing that grudge. Or, or maybe he's just kind of like, hey, Matthew still has nice clothes and nice sandals. I know where he got that money, and, and he, he's offended by that. Maybe it's James. James just doesn't ever really care about, uh, he doesn't take anyone else into account when it's time to eat the meal. And, and if there's leftovers, James takes it, doesn't ask anyone else. And, and Peter's offended by this. Uh, maybe it's Thaddeus. Thaddeus has, has been found out to kind of be uh, demeaning Peter's character behind the scene. Whatever it is, uh, we're not told. Maybe it's something from Peter's past. Maybe it's from Peter's childhood. But Peter's trying to wrap his mind around this kind of radical kind of kingdom, counterculture, and he thinks he gets it. He, he thinks he's finally got it. So in verse 21, we pick up the story. It says, Then Peter came up to him and came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Now listen to what Peter says, as many as seven times? Now, 
you've, you're, you, you might be familiar with this passage already, so that doesn't shock you or uh, any of that. But the, the conventional teaching of the day, the rabbis taught you, you as God's people needed to be a forgiving people. You needed to forgive someone three times if they committed the same offense. And honestly, that's kind of generous, right? I, I am not always quick to forgive after one time. You do the same thing a second time, I'm, I'm back into that worldly model where I want to get distance from you. A third time seems generous. But Peter says, no, no, no. Jesus is, is unlike any other rabbi. He, he is extreme. And so, Jesus, I'm going to double that and add one for good measure, the perfect number, seven. How many times do I need to forgive these dudes that were with us? Seven times, Jesus? And at this point, Peter is expecting Jesus to have a big smile and say, Peter, finally, you got it. You got it. That is, that's the kind of generosity. That's kind of the, the forgiveness that my people should have. But that's, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Or, or literally in the Greek, it says seven times 70, 490 times. A, a couple weeks ago, uh, one of my daughters was... And she gave me permission to share this story. So um, she was lamenting the fact that her sisters were uh, in the same way, just kind of taking advantage of her and, and sinning against her. And she's like, Dad, I was like, you need to just forgive her, forgive them. She's like, I do forgive them. Well, you need to keep forgiving them. Well, I have. And, and she finally, she says, Dad, I've forgiven them 490 times. Well, obviously, Jesus isn't really saying to Peter, hey, it's 77 or 490. He's saying, Peter, stop counting. The kind of kingdom forgiveness, because relationships matter, there, there isn't a counter that, that, is, that could go high enough for that because they matter to God. And, and before they can have these objections, because that just is crazy. I, how, how could we just continue to forgive people that continue to offend us Jesus says, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about the kingdom. Verse 23. It says, therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Again, by now we know the parables. We start to put the, the people in the right places. But, but just in this one verse, you should know that the, the, there is a day where the king will come and he will settle accounts. It says that the king's going to come and, and he's going to settle his accounts with his servants. Verse 24. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Anyone get paid in talents this week? No, no. That's a, actually just a system of measurement, of, of weight. Uh, so we don't know if it's 10,000 weights. We, we don't know what it is of, of gold or silver. But, but historians tell us that one talent equal the average wages of someone for 20 years. So whatever you made this year on your, uh, whatever you told the IRS or whatever you actually made, uh, you can just multiply that by 20. Imagine not spending any money for, for that whole time and you've got one talent. Now multiply that by 10,000. This is a ridiculous amount. It probably would have caused some laughter in the disciples. 10,000 talents? Historians say that that's probably more than all the, the coinage in circulation at that time. This is like us saying a gazillion. And he says, so somehow this servant, now how does a servant get that much in debt? Well, this is, some, this is probably not the cook or the maid or something like that. This is probably what, what's called a satrap or a, uh, what's called a vassal king. And so Caesar in Rome uh, had these other kings over regions. And they were the servants to Caesar. Caesar and they were responsible to give an account for how they, they handled Caesar's money. And so uh, this, in this scene, in this picture, one of these guys is brought in. And of course, he's terrified in this moment. He's made some bets that clearly have not put off. And he is, he is at the risk of the whole kingdom putting the king's uh, livelihood at risk. And it says he owed 10,000 talents. Just, just as far as you could possibly imagine the debt that he owes, he owes this king. Verse 25. And since he could not pay his master, his, pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. And so the king says, okay, you can't pay me back, but, but uh, your life is effectively over. 
You're going to be sold. Your wife's going to be sold somewhere else. Your kids are going to be sold. Your donkey's going to be sold. Your land, everything that you have. And I'm going to get back just the smallest portion of what you owe me. I'm going to get back. Your life is over. Verse 26. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. So, so you see, I mean, he's desperate in this moment. He is on his face. He, he is uh, before this massive debt that he could not possibly ever pay. He, he's just either trying to convince the king or himself or just one last Hail Mary. Would you please uh, just be patient with me? I'll pay it all back. But, but what he's not recognizing is he could never pay this debt back. It would take literally lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And, and just the interest alone would make the debt go bigger and bigger. He would never pay this debt back. There is no hope. No chance. No hope. So he says, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And this is actually kind of what, what we do w- with the king. When we, when we come to God, and it doesn't matter where you live, what time, what culture, in, in human history, there are always these systems that say, hey, here's what you do to pay God back. Here's the prayers that you pray. Here's the times of the day. Here's the foods that you do eat, the foods that you don't eat. Here's the actions that you need to do. Here's the actions that you don't need to do. You need to work harder, try more, do more, do more. And then hopefully, hopefully at the end of the day, you'll have $10,000 talents to pay back. And what Jesus is showing in this parable, and the first obstacle that we got to just recognize is we could never possibly ever pay this back. There is no hope in and of ourselves. Our our credit will never outweigh our debit. There is no hope for this man. Verse 27, and out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. This, this is a grace bomb. Now notice the debt is still there, but he forgives it. So someone had to bear, bear the cost of forgiveness. Who had to bear the cost of forgiveness? The king had to bear the cost. Grace and forgiveness is costly. It's painful. And so he bears the, cross, the, the cost of that. Uh, and as he does, it says he had pity for him. That, that word is actually the same word used for compassion. It's a word that's come up time and time again in, in Matthew's gospel. It is the word that most often describes the internal state of Jesus. He has compassion. And we've seen throughout this book that his compassion is not a feeling. It is always a, a feeling that leads to loving action. And so this king has pity. He drops the grace bomb. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. It's going to cost the king everything to give this guy grace. And so the first obstacle to having a gospel culture in our lives and ourselves is understand the debt that we owed. Uh, understand the massive weight that was on us. Understand we had no hope apart from ourselves, uh, in, in and of ourselves. And then grace comes on the scene. So you're starting to put the picture uh, of who. The, the king is represented uh, by, by Jesus and, and, and we're the servant. But uh, he it just drops this grace bomb. Now imagine, imagine if at this moment the servant says, oh, thank you, thank you so much. Now I'm going to try so hard to pay you back. Maybe it'd be a slap in the face. But isn't that what we do? We come to God, we taste his grace and mercy, and we're like, okay, God, I'm going to pay you back for this. I remember one one time at church, uh, someone I hadn't seen for like six months, they show up, they come in and and they're like, oh, would you, I was like, it's good to see you again. And they're like, well, you know, God was so good to me this week, I just figured I need to show up to pay him back. I'm like, wow, I'm sure he loves that. So that, that would be an offense to God to say I could pay you back. Or imagine if uh, the, the, the king says, no, I'm going to let you go. You're, you're, you're free to go. And the guy gets up and he says, now, that's kind of narrow-minded. <laughs> like, like, surely uh, I could pay you back in other ways. Like, no, no, no. This, this is the way I'm going to pay you back. Or, or, or how, how about with God? As he pays the price for grace. And, and grace and forgiveness is always costly for those that give it. And he sends his son Jesus to die on a cross in our place to pay our penalty. And the servant comes to him and says, surely there's other ways. 
I mean, that's okay. If that works for some people, that, that's fine. But, but there's other paths to, to pay this back. Do you, th- th- there's insanity to that. Like if there was any other way, you can reject Christianity and you should, but do not lump it in with all the other religions of, of paying God back because if there was any other way, any other way to take this massive debt off our back, then he would spare his own son the, the horror of the cross. There is no other way. And so he sends his son. Grace is so radical and so needed in our world. C.S. Lewis in the, the 1950s was invited to a religious symposium. And during one of the sessions, they were, they were arguing of what, if any, unique contributions Christianity added to the world religions. And they argued for a while. Someone said, well, it's, it's the resurrection. And they said, no, there's some minor little uh, stories of resurrection and other religious accounts over here. Others said, no, it's the virgin birth. And like, no, we actually have some stories of virgins giving birth in these accounts here. So that's not it. And then finally, C.S. Lewis walks in the room as they're arguing. And he says, what's the rumpus about? And they tell him. And he's like, oh, that's easy. It's grace. Grace. Grace is the unique contribution that Christianity brings to the world. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. And so that, that's the first thing is to, to be a people that understand the grace that we receive. But it doesn't stop there because the story isn't over. There, there's a second obstacle. Look what it says. It says, uh, uh, have patience with me. Okay. Released him, forgave him debt. Verse 28. It says, but now you wouldn't expect that word right there. What I would expect is, and then, but sounds contradictory, but, and then, I would expect, and then, the guy that has been forgiven, and then, the guy that has his life back, and his family back, and, and, and has freedom, and then that guy went out with explosive joy, explosive hope, just, just telling, singing the praises of the king. That's what I would expect the story to go. But that's not how the story goes. This guy who's been forgiven this massive debt. Verse 28, Jesus says, but... When that same servant, who was forgiven so much, went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Denarii was a day's wage. So not an insignificant amount, amount, three months worth of uh, of pay. Found that someone owed him a hundred denarii. What's he going to do? And seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So so he leaves there, totally forgiven, totally free. He walks out into the world and he sees someone and he says, that guy owes me three months wages. And something snaps. He doesn't connect the dots. He goes up to that guy. He grabs him by the throat, throws him on the wall and says, pay what you owe. You owe me a debt and I'm calling it in right now. Pay what you owe. Verse 29, so his fellow servant fell down pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. That's an echo of verse 26. Have patience with me and I will pay you. And even that doesn't ring any bells in this guy's mind. Can can you just have mercy on me? Can you just give me some time? Can you be patient with me in this moment? Verse 30, he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Now he was exercising his rights. He had the right to throw this guy in prison because the debt had not been paid back. And so he does that. He's just demanding his rights, going through the world, totally disconnected from the grace and mercy that he had received. Verse 31, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. Now, now they're, they're probably distressed by this guy beating this guy up and throwing this guy in jail, but, but they are greatly distressed, not because of all those things. They're greatly distressed at the hypocrisy of this guy's life. They're greatly distressed. They went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Verse 33. And should you not have have had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you? It's a good question. You ever ask yourself that question? Should I not have mercy on our fellow servants as God has had mercy on me? 
Jesus is pointing out a, a massive contradiction in our lives. When we have tasted and seen the grace and mercy of God, and we sing songs of it, it's not because Christian songwriters lack thematic diversity. It's because the cross and what Christ has done is worthy of our songs, worthy to be reminded of all that God has done for us. We do that. We come to this table. We're reminded of God's love for us. And then we go out there. And so often we are not the people of grace that have received the grace. I know that's true of me. I'm embarrassed to think of some of the ways that just uh, a stranger could set me off in public. I don't even know this person. I'm embarrassed how when I put on that mask and I go into a store because I remembered at that time how self-righteous I am when someone doesn't have a mask on. I'm like, what's wrong with this person? But if I go in forgetting my mask, I'm like, just give me grace. I, I, it's in my car. I forgot. You know what I'm saying? We, we look for the offense Hey, and we don't give the grace and mercy that we receive. Jesus is just pointing out there is a massive disconnect here that should not be. We, we are, the second obstacle to overcome, with one is we've got to receive the grace, but we are now called to be conduits of the grace that we receive. There's more than enough. He's given us more than enough. And if we give it away, he promises to give us more. Why don't we have a better reputation in the world? Uh, Philip Yancey, in his great book, What's So Amazing About Grace?, Highly recommend it. Just kind of is on this whole theme the whole time. But he says as he was writing the book he, he, and preparing, he kind of did an informal survey of everyone he met in airports and, and in public places. And he just said, hey, uh, just tell me what's the first thing you think about when I, when I say the word Christian? He said he heard a lot of different things. He heard some good things, some bad things. He heard uh, things about morality and, and, and political positions. He said, I never once heard the word grace. We are called to be the people of grace. He, he tells a, another story in the book of a friend of his who's a counselor. And this friend was uh, meeting with a, a drug-addicted prostitute. And her life had gone so off course that, that this prostitute, just to get her next fix, was now renting out her daughter to the men because she got more money and got more drugs from that. Just horrific, horrific scene. And the counselor was, well, one, she, she needed to report this, but she was just at a loss for words. And she said, have you, ever thought about, have you ever thought about going to a church? And the prostitute looked at her shocked with naivety, like, are, are you serious? She said, why would I ever want to go there? They'll just make me feel worse than I already do. Why is it that our, that's our reputation? Because in Jesus' time, that's the kind of woman that would run to Jesus. Those are the kind of people that would flee to him and find in him mercy and grace and forgiveness. Why can't they find that from us? Because there's this disconnect. There's this disconnect. And then uh, we see in the very last word, this one thing. It says, and, and in his anger... The master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brothers from your hearts. I wish verse 35 wasn't in our Bibles. Now we want to be careful here. Jesus is not con contradicting the rest of the Bible, the rest of the New Testament on what it means to be saved. What he is showing is that there must and should be a connection between what we say we believe and how we live. That there is this conduit of grace that comes from us and through us. That is evidence that your faith is genuine. I wrote this this week. I said, the truest and best indicator of what you really believe about grace is how you respond when you are sinned against. The truest and best indicator of what you really believe about grace is how you respond when you are sinned against. Why, why do we cling so much to unforgiveness? Why do we cling to the anger? Why, why, why do we not recognize that we are owed a debt, but maybe because we like it too much? I have a quote on the screen. Frederick Buechner said this about unforgiveness. He says, of the seven deadly sins... Anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue to the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, 
to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back in many ways is a feast fit for a king. But he goes on. He says, the chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. So Jesus isn't just inviting us to be people of grace because we represent him. That, that would be more than enough. But he's inviting us to be people of grace because it's for our joy and God's glory and for our freedom to, to release other people, to forgive them. Again, the truest and best indicator of what you really believe about grace is how you respond when you're sinned against. Now, I, I want to be careful here. I, I recognize that in this room, there are deep, deep wounds. And I'm not saying in this moment, when you come to this table, it'll be totally forgotten. But I'm saying today is a day that you can say, yes, I've received the grace of God. And Lord, I don't know how, and it's going to take a miracle. uh, And I, I just can't do this on my own. Jesus says, good. And you're right. It does take a miracle. The miracle took place on the cross in your place. And the power that is available to you to begin the process of forgiving A mother, a father, an ex-husband or wife, a a spouse, a child, whatever the case may be. In this room, there there are deep, deep wounds that we all carry. But I believe God wants to do some work in us. Jesus says, they will know that you're Christians by the way you love. How do we become the kind of people that not only receive the grace of God, but give this kind of scandalous, countercultural, counterintuitive, leaning in kind of grace? You know what? When the world sees it, they take notice. Sometimes it makes it on the front page of the newspaper. I was thinking about this this week, several examples. I was thinking about Rachel Denhalder, if you know her story, but I was actually thinking of uh, Charleston, South Carolina, 2015, June 17th. A guy named uh, Dylan Roof, a white supremacist, went into Emmanuel AME Church. Actually, I actually have a picture of the church here. Emmanuel AME Church, one of the oldest, most historic black churches in America, over 200 years old. He went into this church and they welcomed him in. They said, we're having Bible study. Would you like to join us? And he joined them. And he sat there through the Bible study. And at a certain point, he pulled out a gun and he began to shoot the church members in the basement. He killed nine of them. He wounded one more. He went up to one woman who was hiding under uh, a table who was watching her son bleed out and die. And he leaned over and he said, have I shot you yet? She said, no, you haven't. He said, well, I'm not going to because I want you to go tell this story. And he left. The next day he was arrested. But that's not the most shocking part of the story. The next day on June 19th, was his bond hearing. And the judge allowed the victims and the family members of the victims to come and say something before the hearing. And one by one, these people who had been so wounded, had so much loss, were so angry, one by one, they stood before Dylan and before the judge. And they said, Various things. You can go to the Washington Post article. In fact, you can find it on a a hundred different newspapers from that time. They said things like, I am so hurt. I will never see my mom again. I will never hold her again. But my mom taught me that we are a family built on love and hate will not reign in our house. So I forgive you. May God have mercy on your soul. One by one. One by one. One by one. The only way you can be in that moment and have that kind of conduit of grace is is to be a kind of people that so are overwhelmed, so blown away by the mercy and grace of God, so in tune with what Jesus did when he went to the cross. And as they nailed him to the cross, they are so much like their Savior when Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's a supernatural kind of miraculous grace. And that, that took the world off guard, by surprise. And this isn't minimizing the the, the problems and the, the racism and all those things. It's just saying what our world desperately needs right now is people rescued by the grace of God, of being conduits of, of peace and mercy and grace in our world right now. 
So, so today I want to just conclu- conclude in, in just a slightly different way. I want to invite the, the band to come back up here. I just want us to take a few moments, you guys can come on up, to, uh, to just do some, do some work between you and your God. To, to consider the obstacles that you face in your life. To consider the grace and mercy that, that you've received and then consider the implications of that in your life. And so let me just lead us uh, just in, in some thought here. I invite you to bow your head and close your eyes as you think about what Jesus is teaching us this morning. Father, Lord, there are, there are wounds and hurts in this room. Lord, we, uh, we, we know that in our own strength uh, we, that there are sins that we can't forgive. Father, I want to pray for those that were wounded as children by those that should have been loving them. Lord, I pray for those that just have deep scars from a father from a mother. Lord, I pray for those that have just been nursing a grudge against a spouse in this room or maybe an ex-spouse. Lord, and and they've been wounded and uh, they've got a huge debt. A hundred (laughs) denarii. But Lord, it is nothing nothing compared to the debt that you've forgiven them. Lord, wake us up to the reality of the debt that we've been forgiven and make that stir in our hearts and our souls now. Lord, make us like Emmanuel AME Church, a gospel culture that when the worst thing imaginable, the most horrific sin would be perpetrated on us, we would be so in tune with our Savior that we could say, we forgive you. Lord, I pray that uh, before our brothers and sisters in this room right now come to this, Lord, they would just do some work in their heart with you before they come to this table. Lord, just show them these two great realities that they've been forgiven much and they are called to forgive much. And then give them the faith to step forward and to grab the cup and take the bread and to crush it between their teeth and reminded that you were crushed for their sins and to drink the wine and be reminded that you bled to pay their debt. Lord, it is amazing grace. Lord, please do a work in our marriages, do a work in our parenting, do a work in our gospel communities, in our core groups, in our church. Lord, let us be a a, a community that leans in in times of offense and wounded. So now, Lord, Holy Spirit, we're just asking for you to do a a freeing work for your glory and for our joy. Free us from the burden of holding debt over other people's hearts and lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.